A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How's everyone today? Good, thank you so much for joining us. You are um, for an absolute treat. Um, our lecturer tonight has been with um, Oceania Region about five or six years and has been to over uh, 160 different countries. Um, you're in for a, a wonderful treat and they're always a pleasure to have back and are some Oceania favorites. So please welcome at this time, Don Campbell. Good afternoon, everyone, welcome. As Sean told you, I've been to one or two countries Basically, except for North Korea, I think if they have salt water on them, we've probably been there. Um, and obviously, we don't want to go to North Korea. Uh, maybe you do, but I think I'll pass for a while because I, I don't want to get uh, punished for my, my posture. Uh, <laughs> that was yesterday's news? Yeah. Okay, now, I made a bad mistake, ladies and gentlemen, so I've got to take a moment here. I can't find my talk. There it is. We're going to talk about Rhodes and Cyprus today. And I, I think you're going to enjoy Rhodes and Cyprus. They're, they're kind of unique. They're a little bit different. Rhodes, as you know, is another Greek island, and we've all seen Greek islands, so we don't need to spend a whole lot of time uh, going into it. But we are going to enjoy it. And uh, this presentation is just one of a whole series that I'm doing. Some have been on the, uh, the television so far. Um, and this one will also be on the television on Channel 8 and it'll run sequentially till we get to the end of the cruise. Basically, I'm your destination enrichment lecturer. Russ is the uh, special interest lecturer. Uh, in our talks, we cover basically all of the ports on the itinerary, and we also try to give you some little tidbits of information about the places we're going. We talk about the culture, the history, the people, uh, a little bit about the geology. Uh, we try to make them fun. I don't, I don't like to use... Um, dates any more than I have to. So I put things in a little bit of chronological order. I sometimes use dates. I do not give final exams, so you don't even have to take a whole lot of notes. Uh, if you get really tired at night and you can't sleep, you can put on Channel 8 and it'll help you get back to sleep. My wife loves to do that. Uh, anyway, let's get started and we're going to first go off and look at uh, Rhodes, Greece, uh, and then we're going to go to Limassol, uh, Cyprus a little bit later. Now, Rhodes is both an island and a city that's on that same island, and it's, uh, the island itself is also called the Island of the Knights, uh, Knights spelled with a K, not with a, just an N. Uh, the city of Rhodes is located up on the northern tip of the island, and that's where you're going to find both the ancient and the modern commercial harbor. Uh, Rhodes is an island. It's about 50 kilometers, uh, uh, or 80 kilometers, about 50 miles wide uh, or long, whichever that way is, and maybe uh, 38 uh, kilometers or 24 miles wide. Kind of looks a little bit like an ancient spear point, so you, it gives you an idea, and that's oriented the way it really is in the Mediterranean. It consists mostly of limestone, uh, which means that this island was once totally under the sea. Uh, the interior of the island is very mountainous, uh, not mountainous the way you think of the Rockies or the Alps, but mountainous as far as islands go. Uh, it's covered with forest of both uh, pine and cypress trees. The shoreline itself is pretty rocky, but there are some areas along the shore where they grow citrus fruit, uh, wine grapes, uh, let's see what else they grow there, vegetables, olives, and so on. Uh, it's very typical of all the islands in the Aegean because it is very rocky, very difficult to farm. Outside the city of Rhodes, uh, uh, the island is dotted with a lot of little small villages. And they even have some spas for those of you who want to have a spa treatment and you can't stand the spa on the ship for whatever reason. Uh, they offer a variety of health treatments using both mineral water uh, and seawater, uh, which I think you could probably get if you just jump off the ship. <laughs> now, every summer, Rhodes is visited with these very pretty Jersey tiger moths. Uh, uh, they gather in this Pentaludes Valley uh, basically, the Greek name Penteludes translates to Valley of the uh, Butterflies. Uh, it's about 23 kilometers from Rhodes. That's less than 15 miles from where the ship is going to tie up. Uh, the moths like the very high humidity that exists down in that valley, and they also like the oriental sweet gum trees that uh, grow there. The sweet gum trees give off a scent that uh, kind of attracts the moths. Now, it does smell a little bit like vanilla. Uh, and the local churches here even use it to make incense. So it's a very unique area. 
Uh, moths cover the entire landscape. It's almost like looking at something with a tapestry on it when they're in uh, their full uh, flocking here. Uh, but because of the numbers of visitors that have gone to this valley to see the moths, the population of the moths has started to pretty drastically decline. So the local authorities and the, all of the uh, naturalists want people to be a little careful when they go visit this place and not make a lot of noises or try to startle the moths because the moths don't have a stomach. And because they don't have a stomach, they don't have any residual energy, so they get exhausted very quickly if they get scared. I didn't know you could scare moths. I thought you'd just use a swatter and hit them. But anyway, uh, so they want you to be, be, be a little careful and make sure that you just kind of uh, enjoy the moths. Don't, uh, don't try to take them home as a souvenir. Uh, the island of Rhodes is also known for its population of these little fallow deer. Uh, they're genetically very distinct uh, and kind of like the moths, they're also in very bad decline. In the wild here on the island, there's only maybe 100 or 150 of these small deer, even though they've been here for centuries. Um, there are also about 70 other deer that aren't in the wild that are actually maintained by the municipality of Rhodes, and uh, they're in the moat of the fort by the city. Uh, many believe that the, the deer were brought here by the Crusaders. Uh, the Crusaders allegedly, by legend, brought the deer here because they could use the deer to guard their fortresses and their little enclaves, and they also, the deer would uh, keep the snakes away. Well, that's nice to know, but the deer don't hunt snakes, and the deer have been in the Aegean for maybe since the 6th millennium BCE, so that was a little bit before the Crusaders got here. Uh, there is one thing that is a fact, though, is that the deer's antlers give off a, a kind of an alkaline smell or something that the snakes don't like. So the snakes don't come around the deer, not because they're afraid of being hunted, but because they don't like the smell. Now, Rhodes was inhabited during the Stone Age, but there are very few artifacts that are left. Uh, some 3,600 years ago, the Minoans finally showed up on the island. And then about 100 years later, that they were invited by the Mycenaean Greeks. Uh, the Greek author Pindar, uh, most of you might have read him, well, maybe not, uh, he wrote an ode about Rhodes uh, saying that it was born from the union of Helios, the sun god, and the nymph Rhodes. Uh, she was a minor goddess, I guess. Uh, the myth goes something like this. When the gods of Olympus, you know, Zeus and Hades and all those guys, when they divided up the earth, they kind of forgot the sun god Helios because he was off flying around in his flaming chariot. Uh, anyway, when he finally came back from his travels across the skies, he kind of looked around and said, well, I didn't get much. Uh, but he decided he could come down from up on high. And he looked as he was coming down, and he saw an island that was submerged deep under the water. So he went to his uh, fellow god, Poseidon, and the two of them decided they could bring this landmass up from below the water, uh, and the roads appeared. And it was called the Island of Roses because at the time they had wild roses on it. Now, the name of the Island of Roads actually is in homage to the nymph Rhodes, who was a daughter, daughter of Aphrodite. The myth also says that the very first inhabitants of Rhodes were kind of amphibious little sea creatures that came up. They were the children of, of Aphrodite, children of the sea, and they came up on the shore, but they were also very skilled inventors and craftsmen and artisans. Uh, so that's how the people of Rhodes got here. Now, Homer mentioned Rhodes uh, participating in the Trojan Wars. And during the Peloponnesian Wars, the Persians invaded and they overran the island. Well, in turn, uh, they were defeated by forces from Athens. And that made the island part of Alexander the Great. You remember him. Uh, he was in my last talk. There was a mosaic of him riding a horse. He conquered all of the world, practically, or at least the known world at the time, from Greece all the way to India. Anyway, uh, that made the island part of his empire uh, after he had conquered Persia. Now, the Acropolis of Rhodes was built uh, about the time the early uh, Mycenaean, Mycenaeans got here. It was one of the most important centers of worship. Uh, education, uh, recreation, and all that sort of thing in, in the early times. Uh, in ancient Greece, the Acropolises were 
normally built up on an elevated area, up on the top of a hill or whatever. Uh, and a lot of times the, the place the Acropolis was built was for defensive purposes. Now the Acropolis on Rhodes was constructed up on what is known as St. Stefano's Hill. But when you're here, you may also ha hear people um, relate to it as Mount Smith or Mont Smith, uh, which doesn't sound very Greek because it isn't. Anyway, the hill's modern name, or that Mont Smith, was because they had a, an English, um, I guess he was an admiral. He might have been a general, but I think he was an admiral who established a lookout post up on the top of the mountain, which is where the Acropolis is, to keep an eye on Napoleon's ships back around 1800. He didn't trust the French, so he wanted to make sure he could keep an eye on them. Anyway, so they put it up there and they renamed the mountain after him. Now you can walk to the top of that mountain if you really have a mind to, or you could take a donkey. It's a little different than the donkeys on, on uh, uh, our next port of call, but uh, you can get up there by a donkey. And one of the reasons that you might want to go there is uh, it's got a really spectacular view of the surrounding area. And of course, that's one of the reasons they built the Acropolis up there was because it was easy to see everything around. And up on the top of the hill, there are uh, they're kind of ruins for the most part. There's temple, temples, sanctuaries, some residences, a 4th century BCE Doric temple. Uh, they also have ruins of a walled uh, fortress. You can see part of the walled fortress in this picture. Uh, and that came from uh, back in the 15th century. And then there's remains of an ancient temple uh, that was the temple of Lindian Athena. Now, Lindian was a god who was uh, pre-Hellenic, before the Greeks came here. She was the goddess that they, they uh, acknowledged. And then her temple was taken over and used uh, to honor Athena. After Alexander the Great's death, uh, his generals kind of divided up the kingdom. Uh, and Rhodes ended up in a part of the kingdom that was very, had very strong ties with Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, Egypt at the time was uh, ruled by Ptolemy I. And uh, the Ptolemaic Empire, or family, ruled that country for eh, 300 years. The last ruler in that particular dynasty was Cleopatra VII. Now, Ptolemy founded the Library of Alexander in Egypt, uh, but his first military concern or his first uh, effort militarily was to go out uh, to help the people on the island of Rhodes. Uh, and because he was so successful in defending them, they called him their savior. Uh, Rhodes developed into one of the most important uh, seafaring and trading centers in the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, its, its coins have been found almost all over uh, the Mediterranean region. The tomb of the Ptolemies, at least the Ptolemies who remained here on uh, Rhodes, dates from back into very early Tome Ptolemaic times. And it's in a place that it's dug into a rock, uh, in a rock wall in this place called Rodini Park. It's considered one of the oldest planted parks. It, it didn't start out to look the way it is, but it, men came in real early on, back in the, in the early ages, planted trees, made paths, and so on considered one of the earliest planted parks in Europe. And here they had schools for philosophy, science, literature, and rhetoric. Um, and all of those schools had kind of an Egyptian flavor to them. The Egyptians had a great influence on all of that. Now, rhetoric today kind of means uh, the art of effective communication. Sometimes we wonder about rhetoric when we listen to the television. But anyway, it means effective communication. Uh, and, and it was studied by ancient Greek and Roman uh, leaders. It was intended to help the citizens in those countries to plead their cases in a court of law. So it was, it was a very different thing than we think of as rhetoric. Uh, there were some pretty important people who studied here in Rodini Park, and they included uh, Julius Caesar, Cicero, uh, Pompey, Brutus, and even Mark Antony. I, I'm not sure if Mark, Ant Mark Antony learned his speech, you know, et tu brute and all that kind of stuff that you get out of Shakespeare here, but he did learn a little bit about talking. Anyway, the city of Rhodes itself was, uh, began back about 407 BCE, and it was built using plans that were devised by a Greek named Hippodamus. Now, Hippodamus was an ancient architect, a physician, a mathematician, 
meteorologist and philosopher. He's kind of like me. He couldn't figure out what one job was going to be for his life. Uh, he's considered to be the father of modern urban planning. In 305 BCE, Demetrius of Macedon surrounded the Rhodes area. Uh, he, put it on, he wanted to break its ties with Egypt. He was very upset that he didn't have links directly to them. Uh, he created these huge siege engines. Uh, they were really huge. They were big high towers uh, with battering rams. Uh, they weighed mm, maybe 163 kilograms or maybe 180 tons in, in modern terms. Uh, they were the most powerful weapons of the time. Well, after a year, Demetrius uh, decided that he wasn't going to get anywhere with the sea, so he abandoned it. He signed a peace treaty and left the island. Well, he figured it was too hard to take all that stuff with him, so he left it behind. And the local people then started to take all of the metal from the siege equipment that Demetrius had left behind, and they set up a scaffolding, and they used it to erect a statue to their sun god, Helios. I bet you know what's coming, right? This is just a drawing. It's not the real one. Nobody knows what the real one really looked like. It was called the Colossus of Rhodes, and it was to become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It is said that the statue stood on a 15-meter or 59-foot high uh, white marble pedestal, and the description says white mar marble pedestal, not pedestals. Uh, that's kind of an interesting Side note, anyway, the bronze statue itself that stood on that pedestal was 30 meters or about 98 feet high. Uh, the ancient accounts described the structure as having an iron inner structure or tie bars to which brass plates were attached to make the skin. Uh, they put large stones inside the statue for stability, uh, and the Colossus of Rhodes was completed in 280 BCE. Uh, unfortunately, it was destroyed by an earthquake just 56 years later. Now, as it fell, it demolished nearby houses. And as you can see, there, there doesn't appear to be any houses right close to it. So either that's not where it was or the cl there's no houses there. Anyway, afterward, the Oracle of Delphi uh, forbid that it ever be re-erected. said, no, 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 don't do that again. Uh, eventually, the ruins could be seen or were reported to be seen up until about... 655 in the Common Era. So the ruins were there for a long, long time. And interestingly, that's when Arab inva uh, invaders, uh, the uh, Muslims, came in. They dismantled the remains, and they sold them to a Jewish merchant. Now there's something to take to trivia tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> now archaeologists have found uh, the, the remains of the harbor, Mandrake Harbor, is where the Rhodes uh, Colossus was supposedly standing, uh, but they've never found any trace of the statue itself. It's just a total mystery. Uh, there is some speculation that the Colossus may actually have been located up on the Acropolis. Now, in my opinion, that makes more sense because you could see it from all over the place if it was up there, uh, but they haven't found anything up there either. Or it could have been built over just standing all by itself on the top of what we know today as Fort St. Nicholas, and that's that fort that's over in the background. Now, at the time of the Colossus, uh, Rhodes was controlling the grain trade all across the Mediterranean, particularly in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. The island nation had a, an excellent navy that was manned by some of the finest sailors in the area. Uh, by the end of the century, though, the, where the uh, Colossus had uh, collapsed, uh, Rhodes had to appeal to the Roman Republic uh, uh, for help against invading forces from Macedonia. Uh, the end result of that was the Second Macedonian War, and that conflict ended when Macedonia's role as a major uh, regional player ended, and uh, that preserved Rhodes independent. It also made them very, very much part of the Roman uh, theater. Now we're going to jump forward a little bit to uh, 1309, uh, the Crusader Knights of St. John conquered Rhodes. This is during one of the Crusades. Uh, they built very strong defenses, uh, somewhat like this uh, Fort St. Nicholas that I talked about a moment ago. The tower itself that you see here was built in the 1400s. Now, after the siege of Rhodes, this is the siege by the Crusaders, uh, they built a bastion around this fortress, uh, uh, and that transformed it more into a stronghold to guard the entrance of the harbor. 
Uh, later on, it became an administrative center that the, the, they used for the control of the harbor entrance. In the 20th century, a famous French archaeologist uh, studied this fort and looked at all of the rocks that were there, and he found uh, many, many large marble blocks that were fitted into the structure at uh, various points all around that circular thing. The blocks all seem to date from the same period of the Colossus of Rhodes, so it kind of leads some credence to the possibility that that was the foundation for the, the uh, statue. When put together, the pieces uh, uh, gave a status, uh, a base about 55 feet in diameter, which would have been big enough to hold the, the Colossus itself. Uh, and it all, by the way, that's also the same diameter as the uh, fortress itself. So that may have been the, the, the base for the Colossus of Rhodes. And if they put it there just standing on its two feet, it wouldn't have had to straddle the harbor entrance. Now, the Crusader Knights of St. John were from Jerusalem, and they had a whole bunch of different names. Uh, I think the one most people are familiar with was the Hospitallers. Uh, they were a religious military order uh, that was founded back in the 11th century, and they were headquartered in Rome. Uh, their mission primarily was to care for the sick and poor crusader pilgrims and knights uh, that were moving across into the Holy Land. Uh, they moved to Limassol in Cyprus, and then they, uh, um, then they acquired Rhodes. So they kind of had the ability to go island to island, uh, and they came to rule Rhodes as an independent state. Now, for more than two centuries, the Knights of Rhodes were the scourge of the Muslim shipping all across the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and they constituted pretty much the last Christian outpost in the East. The Grand Master was elected uh, for life, and that was subject to papal confirmation. Uh, the largest structure constructed here on the island was uh, uh, the Grand Master's palace, which is a picture of it is shown here. The palace is also called the Castillo. Uh, it was built at the highest point on roads uh, up by the uh, Ac Acropolis. It was designed to resemble the Papal Palace at Avignon, France, so it has a little bit of history to it. Uh, although I have to tell you, I was at Avignon and it didn't look that much. Maybe it's because the uh, Avignon one is a little better uh, preserved. Anyway, it was a fortress in a time of war, but in peacetime it was a meeting place where the knights would get together, the senior knights would go there and they would have meetings and so on, and today it's a museum. Floor mosaics uh, in, inside of the palace are from the Hellenistic, Roman, and the early Christian times. Uh, they were laid in almost all of the rooms in that palace. Uh, the palace all ha also has some underground rooms that were storehouses or storerooms, and those rooms had a secondary function that they would provide haven for the local people and for the knights if the, the uh, city was ever overrun by invaders. Uh, about the middle of the 19th century in the common era, the first floor of the palace collapsed and restoration was first undertaken in that building back in 1937. Uh, they've been doing it ever since. Back in 1522, Suleiman the Magnificent uh, laid the final siege to Rhodes. Uh, after six months, the knights surrendered, and when they left, they took anybody that wanted to go with them uh, off on their ships as they departed to go back to Rome. Uh, for seven years, those knights kind of wandered around the Mediterranean without a home, uh, and they were trying to find out what they could do. And then the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, gave them the Maltese archipelago. And everybody's wondering about Malta. Well, I'm going to talk about that in a future lecture, and you're going to hear more about those knights when we get to there. 200 years after the knights arrived, Rhodes was conquered by the Ottoman Turks, and I just mentioned that. Now, during the Ottoman occupation, uh, the Turks built new buildings, mostly mosques and public baths and so on, and they were constructed down in the old town of Rhodes. The Ottoman reign lasted until the early 20th century, so it lasted for quite a while, uh, and the nearby islands were seized by the Italians, who also conquered Rhodes. It wasn't until about 1948 that the island of Rhodes became part of Greece, and 40 years later, the medieval portion of the city of Rhodes was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. For those of you who want to get out of the city, Archangelos is located about 30 kilometers to the south of town. You know, that's it, 22, 23 miles, something like that. 
And there you might be able to see some local artisans uh, using traditional weaving uh, skills and, and methods and so on. And they also will be wearing, may be wearing, I should say, traditional clothing. Uh, there's a, a pant-like thing that used to be very popular in Greece called a vrakas. It was a black kind of a pantaloon sort of thing that the men wore. Uh, it was traditional, but they're getting rarer and rarer. People aren't wearing them as much anymore. But, but Archangelos uh, is also known for carpet weaving and goatskin boots. Now, the goatskin boots, actually, they still make them. The cobbler in town still makes these boots. They haven't changed for centuries. The style and the, everything has always been the same. The women uh, wore them, and I think they probably still wear them in the fields when they're working to protect themselves from snakes. That's just what you ladies and gentlemen want to hear about, right, is walking around in a place where they have snakes. Anyway, these boots are unique because they're designed so that when you get up in the morning, you don't have to sort out which foot they go on because they fit both feet equally, and they're quite comfortable. So it might be something to think about if you want to have a goatskin boot to protect you from the snakes. Anyway, I think that's pretty ingenious. Outside the walls of the old town uh, is the new city, and the area is known for the kind of, I guess you'd call it uh, Venetian, neoclassic, and modern buildings. Uh, among them is an Italian governor's palace that's there, and that resembles the Doge's palace that many of you may have seen in uh, Venice. Old, roads, uh, old Town Roads is a mosaic of very different cultures and civilizations because it's, it's been there for 24 centuries, and a lot of people have come and gone over that whole time. When you enter it through the Gate of Freedom, uh, basically you're going into one of the largest medieval towns in all of Europe. Now, I, I hope you really enjoy Rhodes. It's a, it's a really nice place. It's beautiful. Uh, hopefully we'll have really good weather when they're there. The people are wonderful, and I think you're going to find it a, a, a warm and welcoming place. Anyway, let's get on to uh, Cyprus. Now, Cyprus is an I another island. It's an island country off the coast of both Syria and Turkey. It's the third largest size-wise and the third largest uh, population or most populated island in the Mediterranean. It's 240 kilometers or some 149 miles long and 100 kilometers or 62, uh, 62 miles wide. And it doesn't look any different in size than Rhodes did, but trust me, it's quite a bit bigger. Geopolitically, the island is subdivided into four segments, uh, the Turkish Republic, uh, holds the northern Cyprus uh, and it occupies about a third of the island uh, and that's there in a kind of the dark pink. Uh, the two very small areas on the island are under British control and those are the little green things. Those were places that the British took control of uh, back before the Second World War. Uh, also uh, there's the Republic of Cyprus which is generally uh, Greek based and that's the light pink down near the bottom. And between the light pink and the dark pink is kind of a light blue area, and that's uh, where the United Nations peacekeeping forces uh, uh, are acting as a buffer between the north and the south. Now, Cyprus is home to some of the oldest water wells in the world. Unfortunately, the island has always suffered from a shortage of water, uh, and the island relies very heavily just on rainwater every year uh, to provide the household water that they need. Well, to make matters worse for the island, uh, I guess it's kind of progressing over a long time, the annual rainfall has been in pretty rapid decline for the past 30 years. Uh, currently, Turkey, to help its people in the northern part of the island, is building an underwater pipeline, under the sea pipeline, uh, under the Mediterranean to get water to the people in the north. Uh, so that'll provide them with drinking water and irrigation water. The people in the south won't have that and I don't know what they're going to do to solve their water shortages. Now, the earliest known human activity on the island dates to about 12,000 years ago, and archaeological remains from that period include things like a well-preserved Neolithic village. Uh, but the arrival of the first humans correlates with the extinction of uh, uh, dwarf hippopotamuses and dwarf elephants. Wait, wait, dwarf elephants? Dwarf hippos? What's this all about? Where did that happen? Well, actually, the Cypriot dwarf elephant is an extinct species of an elephant that DNA-wise is uh, related to the living Asian elephants. It's one of only a few mammals on Cyprus before the humans arrived. 
they were about a meter. You know, they were only about that tall, uh, somewhere around 40 inches in height. And the fossil remains of the dwarf element, el elephant have also been found on Cyprus, uh, Malta, and Crete. So it's not unique just to this island, but they, they are uh, uh, pretty common. Uh, even the Channel Islands in California, for you people from the States, uh, had a dwarf version of the uh, mastodon. So it's not unique just to this area. Uh, the Cyprus dwarf hippopotamus uh, is an extinct species of hippopotamus. It was about three quarters of a meter tall, and it uh, went extinct about the same time as the elephant, so it was just a little bit shorter. The animals uh, uh, basically lived here in harmony with, with nature for a long, long time, and then man showed up. Now, they got small because of a thing that's called insular dwarfism, and that happens when animals are put on an island or put in an area where there's very scarce resources. The food is not very plentiful. So over many millions of years, they just get smaller and smaller and smaller so they can accommodate the available foods that are there. Uh, sometime around 11,000 BCE, all of these major animals went extinct on Cyprus. Cyprus remained pretty much uninhabited, and there's no real indication that there was a lot of people here until the 9th millennium BCE. Uh, just about 25-minute drive from uh, Limassol, uh, you can go to this Neolithic archaeological site. Uh, basically, that's a Stone Age site. Uh, it's protected as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, Kirokitia uh, dates back to about 7,000 BCE, and it's considered one of the most important prehistoric areas in the eastern Mediterranean uh, because what we've learned about the people who lived there. Uh, we know they, I guess maybe they uh, had the same problem as the hippopotamuses and the elephant because the population of the village was only going to be somewhere around three to 600 people. Uh, people were rather short. The men, uh, on average, were five feet three inches tall. The women were four feet 11, so they were pretty much a little shorter than the average human today. On the average, the uh, adult males lived to be 35 years old and the women lived to be 33. Uh, the village, for some reason, nobody knows why, uh, was suddenly abandoned sometime around 6,000 BCE. The Phoenicians called Cyprus Astarte. Uh, that was named for their goddess of love and beauty, isn't she? Amethyst eyes, gold disc around her neck. Oh, well, anyway, the island was an important religious cult center for the Phoenicians until it was uh, settled by the Mycenaean Greeks. Now, in Greek mythology, the seashore here was where the uh, Aphrodite was born. A location uh, was very strategic in the middle of the uh, Middle East, and Cyprus was occupied by a whole series of, of major powers at the time. You know, uh, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Romans, everybody wanted to come here because of its location. Uh, in 333 BCE, Alexander the Great seized Cyprus from the Persians. Uh, later on, a local bishop was involved in forming the city of Limassol, and it was originally called Lemzos. Uh, history is most linked to, well, I guess the Third Crusade is where most of the history really starts here. Uh, Richard the Lionheart of England, uh, he was the king, and he was on his way to the Holy Land during the Crusades. His fiancée, Baron Guerilla, and his sister Joan, the Queen of Sicily, uh, were also traveling to go to the Holy Land. They were on a different ship than Richard, and, and because of weather conditions and a storm, uh, they arrived here on Cyprus a little bit early, uh, and the governor of Cyprus decided that he had an opportunity to get some ransom, so he planned to capture Berengaria and Joan and, and keep them for ransom until the king arrived. Well, they heard about his plans, and they were able to get back on their ship and get away, uh, get back out to sea. Well, Richard finally came into port. Uh, he met with the governor, and he demanded a contribution to support the crusade. Well, the governor said, no, I don't think so. Well, it wasn't exactly in the governor's best interest because then the Anglo-Normans conquered the island and took it over anyway. Uh, there was a happy ending to this whole story because Richard married, Ber married Berengaria here on the island and she wore the crown of the King of, uh, Queen of England in Cyprus. 
The wedding took place at Lemesos Castle, and it was believed that the castle was constructed back in the 12th century. Now, over the centuries, over hundreds of years, the castle was repeatedly damaged by invaders and earthquakes and pirates and all kinds of things like that. The Ottomans rebuilt it in the late 16th century, and they incorporated some of the aspects of the original structure, uh, but they did make some changes to it. It's located near the old harbor in, in the heart of the city, uh, and today it houses the medieval collection of the Cyprus Museum. Uh, that's mostly artifacts from the early Christian era and later. It's, there's not too much there from before. It exhibits things like cannons and wood carvings, paintings and tombstones. They also have uh, statues and suits of armor and pottery and marble artifacts that round out the collection. So it's a really nice museum. If you're interested in that sort of thing, I, I strongly recommend it. King Richard sold Cyprus to the Knights Templar, and they were pretty wealthy monks and soldiers whose uh, mission originally was the protection of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. Now, the knights decided that they had to get their money back, the money they paid the king to get the island, so they imposed very high taxes on the local population. They, you know, they wanted to get their investment. Uh, basically, that caused the Cypriots to, to revolt, and they complained back to the, the king. They went to King Richard and said, hey, these guys are not doing right by us. Uh, the king agreed with them, and so he took the island back from the Knights Templar, and he turned around and sold it to a very wealth, fr wealthy French nobleman, and that nobleman named his brother Amalric the king of Cyprus. Uh, Amalric was ultimately recognized by King Henry VI, uh, who was the Holy Roman Emperor at the time. Colossi Castle served both the Grand Commander of the Knights of St. John's Order of Jerusalem as well as the Knights Templar as their kind of focal piece uh, headquarters. And legend has it that it was in this castle that King Richard lived uh, while he was on Cyprus. Uh, Colossi Capo, uh, Castle is pretty well preserved. Uh, it's a stronghold that was built by the Crusaders back in the 13th century. It's just a big square tower. From the outside, it doesn't look very impressive. It's 21 meters or some 69 feet high. It has uh, on three floors on the inside. The ground floor was primarily for storage and uh, the second floor, the first floor above ground, was where the kitchens and the food service areas were, and then the top floor was uh, where the living uh, quarters were. Uh, it's not really hard to get to. It's only about 15 kilometers west of the town of Lesmo Lemesos. Uh, to the south of the castle, you can find the ruins of a courtyard that's enclosed by walls and, and the ruins of an old warehouse. Uh, Colosi was an important uh, sugar producing area, uh, in the old times anyway. Uh, now, what do you do if you have excess sugar and grapes? You make wine, right? Okay, you make some wine. Well, the traditional sweet wine of Cyprus uh, became known as Vin de Commanderie, or Commanderaria. Uh, it is known uh, as one of the oldest named wines in the world, having kept that same name for eight centuries. I mean, the people in the Napa Valley would go crazy if they could say that. <laughs> anyway, it's believed to have been given its name by the Crusading Knights back in the 13th century, but they also know that that wine was produced for maybe as long as 5,000 years. I don't know if they aged it that long, but I bet it wouldn't be very good anymore. Anyway, King Richard was so taken with the Commanderia that uh, at his wedding he pronounced it, quote, the wine of kings and the king of wines. I don't think they have it here in the wine cellar on the ship. Uh, equally struck by the intoxicating liquor was the French king, Philippe Augustus, who, said, uh, who was said to have declared it as the apostle of wines. Now, I don't know if, how king and apostle fit together when you're talking about wines. Uh, today, the most popular brand of Commanderia is KEO St. John, it's made with a recipe that's protected by uh, the only, it's the only appellation that's held in Cyprus. A uh, unique feature of the Commanderia is that the grapes are left to dry in the sun for, you know, 10 days or so. Uh, then they're, they're picked uh, and then they're pressed. And it's fortifi fortified with a grape-based alcohol. So it's not just plain wine. It's a fortified wine. Uh, and then it goes into aging in oak barrels for two years before they bottle it. 
Nearly three centuries, uh, Limassol enjoyed a remarkable prosperity. Uh, uh, merchants settled in the city in the 13th century, and the harbor became the center of transportation and trade. In 1473, the Republic of Venice gained control of Cyprus, uh, but Venice really wasn't interested in anything but collecting taxes and exploiting the country's resources. They really weren't here to, to establish any kind of a community. Uh, the Italians built the Venetian walls, but the Ottomans uh, basically uh, uh, continued to raid the island throughout the whole Venetian time that they were here. Uh, the Venetians reinforced the castle of Limassol, and that's the, the castle itself had been there for a thousand years. Uh, already. Now, the castle was used as a prison uh, in er modern times from about 1790 until 1940, and as I said, today it's a museum. Well, the latter part of the 16th century, nearly 60,000 Turkish Ottoman troops gained control over Cyprus. They massacred many of the Greek and Armenian Christian inhabitants, and the Ottoman Empire conquered Limassol with very little resistance. Now, as they say, so much for reinforcing a castle by the, the Venetians. The soldiers settled on the island, and many Turkish peasants and craftsmen uh, migrated here. Uh, the Ottomans abolished the old feudal system that had still been in place under the Venetians. Uh, the head of the Church of Cyprus was allowed to remain, and he acted as a mediator between the Christian Greek Cypriots and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Finally, the Ottoman thing, the island fell into 250 years of decline, so it was a, a pretty dramatic thing to have happen. And the ever-present tax collectors and a uh, uh, whole wave of uh, other issues that came up caused a lot of Greek nationalism to surface on the island. Uh, when the Greek War of Independence began in 1821, uh, many Cypriots left to join the Greek forces. Uh, in response, the Ottoman governor of the island arrested and executed uh, nearly 500 of the prominent citizens of Cyprus, and that included the Archbishop of Cyprus and four other bishops. Uh, within 50 years, the British had come here, and they took over Cyprus. Uh, they got an agreement with the Ottoman government to, to take over control of the island. And one of the reasons that uh, they wanted to occupy Cyprus was to protect the Ottoman Empire, <laughs> I love this, protect the Sultan for, f against Russia in case Russia wanted to invade Turkey. Well, to me, it's on the wrong side of Turkey from where Russia would be, but that's why the Brits wanted to be there. Actually, I, I think the real role that they wanted, the real reason they wanted to have the island was to protect the Suez Canal because the Suez Canal was their major route for going from England to India, which was their primary uh, colony at the time. In the 1960s, the whole island of Cyprus gained independence, and that followed an agreement between the United Kingdom, Greece, and Turkey. Uh, that, that was okay, but militants on the island uh, with support from both their own you know, nationalities, Turkey or Greece, uh, began to organize and, and train. And, Tensions were heightened after the Greek Cypri uh, Cypriot president called for a change in the uh, uh, constitution that the, the Turkish Cypriots just didn't like. Uh, violence erupted after a couple, two Turkish Cypriots were killed by uh, Greek Cypriot police. Uh, that created a real problem, uh, uh, violence that ended uh, after some 500 both Turkish and Greek uh, citizens were killed as well as the destruction of nearly all of the Turkish villages and displacement of some 30,000 Turkish Cypriot people. Uh, the crisis resulted in the deployment of the United Nations peacekeeping forces for the first time in the area. Turkey invaded Cyprus even with that in response to the continuing violence, and it was stopped by a strongly worded message from the President of the United States at the time, Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, he warned that the United States would not stand beside Turkey in case of a Soviet invasion of Turkey. Uh, so the Turkish backed off a little bit, but as, as that was happening, Greek dispatched some 10,000 troops to the island to counter the possible Turkish. <laughs> I mean, it, just, it got to be a little bit crazy over here. Um, anyway, a Greek military junta that took place here on the island uh, resulted in a, a coup d'etat, uh, and they wanted to unite the island with Greece itself. The Turkish Air Force decided they didn't want to have that, so they bombed Greek positions on Cyprus. They dropped paratroopers all over the area. 
troop, uh, Turkish troop ships landed some 30,000 troops on the island along with tanks and trucks and armored vehicles. And finally, they got into some peace negotiations and uh, the Turkish government undertook a second invasion even after the peace treaty. Uh, something around 180,000 Greek Cypriots were forced to leave their homes in the northern part of the island. Remember that dark pink area that was up in the north? Those were almost all Turkish areas, uh, and the Greeks were forced out of there. The last major effort to settle the uh, Cyprus dispute was a plan back in 2004, and that was drafted by the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, uh, Two-thirds of the Turkish people on the island supported that plan, but the vast majority of the Greeks voted against it, and because the Greeks far outnumbered the number of Turks, the plan failed. Uh, today, there's been some easing of restrictions of movement between the north and the south. Uh, uh, in fact, the wall that uh, was established to, to divide the country uh, has been partially torn down, and, and renegotiations have taken place uh, for a reunification of the island. I'd like to close today's presentation with a quote from Cicero. Uh, you'll recall he was one of those guys in the park, the sophist that was at the park that I talked about back in Rhodes. Back in 55 BC, he said, quote, after all, the foundation of eloquence, as of everything else, is wisdom. In an oration, as in life, nothing is harder to determine than what is appropriate. Unquote. <laughs> now you're wondering, what is that? Well, just something for you to think about. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the kind of eclectic mixture of topics that we picked out for you in this particular selection. Uh, if you did, come to my next talk. Um, if you didn't, come to my next talk anyway. Uh, that one is going to be about the World Heritage Sites in Israel. Uh, please check your currents for the time and the, and the date. The place will be in here. Hopefully the band will have moved back on the stage so we'll be able to use the side screens as well and that'll make it a little bit easier. Anyway, I'm going to go out to um, Baristas if you want to meet me out there for a cup of coffee before dinner or whatever. Uh, as always, this will be on the stateroom television on channel 8. Uh, anytime you meet me or Susie or any around the ship, please stop and chat, ask questions. If you want to have a meal with us, please feel free to do so. And we look forward to seeing you around the ship for the rest of the cruise. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.